in the week I asked you to do the um, the quats task on transmission, and I just thought I'd go through some work solutions um, so that you can find those for yourselves when you need them. Um, so we've got a wind powered AC generator being used to supply a dairy farm with its electric power needs. The average power generated by the wind turbine is a thousand kilowatts, so that's going to go on our turbine with a peak output of 340 volts. So as soon as we see the P word peak, we should become suspicious. Uh, we don't want to work with peaks. We want to work with um, RMS voltages. So we're going to do that first. We're going to make that change. It has been placed 300 meters away from the dairy so as not to disturb the cattle. Another thing to look out for, 300 meters away means that there's at least 600 meters worth of wire because it's got to go both ways. Um, and the transmission wires have a resistance of 0 0.05 ohms per meter. Okay. Draw a circuit diagram labelled with relevant symbols and known values and physical properties, blah, 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 showing the location of relevant features, blah, 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 of this setup using common physics conventions. Okay, so we haven't got any transformers in here. So this is literally just a simple uh, series circuit. So we've got an AC generator, which is putting out ooh, some unknown amount of RMS voltage, which we'll work out in a moment. Um, we could label it with 340 volts peak, but I don't like to do that. Um, but we do know it's putting out a thousand watts of energy at some currently unknown voltage. Okay, um, it's a really simple circuit. We just have 300 meters worth of lines going in both directions. We have the dairy over here. We can treat the dairy as just one big resistor for the moment. Um, but we also can't forget that we actually have some resistance in our lines. You can put resistance on both paths, that would be fine, but I just treat the resistance as if it's all in a single place. Even though I know it's distributed along the line, because it's all in series, you can treat it as um, all sort of happening in one spot. Okay, let's work out that um, VRMS before we go any further. So the RMS value, we've got a peak output of 340 volts. Um, we, so what we need to do to get the RMS is just divide by the square root of 2. And I happen to know that when you divide 340 by square root of 2, you get about 240. Um, so I think it's going to be like 241 volts or something. Let's, let's get it more exactly. Um, 340 divided by square root of 2. Uh, 240.4. So 240.4 volts. Um, and... Uh, do we know anything else? 1,000 watts is going out, 300 meters. Okay, we can actually work out what this R is here because we know that we have 600 meters of total line at 0 0.05 ohms per meter. So 600 times 0.5 is, uh, 0.05, sorry, is 30 ohms of resistance in those wires. Okay, calculating the power lost in transmission, well, all we need to do here is we need to realize that by knowing the power and the RMS voltage, we can actually get the current. We can use P equals IV at that generator there. So P equals IV at the generator. And so that's a thousand watts equals some unknown I times 240.4 volts. So our current is going to be 4.159 amps. Um, probably got a few too many sig figs in there, but we can um, we can always get rid of them later if we want to round off. So that's the amount of um, current going through. And then if we want to know how much power is actually being lost on that resistor, so being lost as heat, then we just use P equals I squared R for the wires. So notice I can use P equals IV for the generator because the V is nicely well defined for the generator, but I don't know what the V is that's being lost in the wires, so I better use P equals I squared R. It's just safer. All right, so I'm going to take this value here and square it. 4.16 amps squared times 30 ohms. And I get uh, 519 watts. Um, so that's 519 watts out of a thousand that we started with. So that's not a very good run. Um, all right, so moving on to question three. All right, calculate the RMS voltage delivered to the dairy farm 
in this original arrangement. Well, that's fairly straightforward. We started with 240.4 volts in. So going into the system from the generator. Uh, we can work out how much we're going to lose on that resistor by just using uh, V equals IR. So V equals 4.159 amps times 30 ohms VW, V wires, we get 124.8 volts lost on those wires. So if we just look at these two numbers, we just subtract and we can get what's left for the dairy. So V for the dairy will be 240 minus that. And we get 115.6 volts. And let's just round that off 116 volts. So we're not pretending that we've got more position than we do. You could have chosen to do this another way you could have said, okay, we've lost 519 watts in the wires. That leaves us with 481 watts. And then we could take that 481, divide by the current to get the voltage. Um, that would also work. Um, so let me just sketch out that quickly. P in was 1,000 watts. Uh, P used in wires was uh, 519 watts. So P for the dairy... If 519 is wasted, then that leaves 481 watts. We could then say, okay, well, that's equal to IV. So P dairy equals I dairy, V dairy. And we could say 481 watts equals uh, 4.16 amps times some unknown current could be, sorry, times some unknown voltage. And our unknown voltage is going to be, do this division, you're going to get around about 116 volts as well. So it doesn't matter whether you do this with a sort of power's eye view or a voltage eye view, um, it works out the same either way. Um, I don't even really need to read this question. I know what the next question is always going to be in one of these problems is, oh, we started with this system, which was really bad. We're going to put some transformers in. All the information I really need to get here is what is the ratios? Okay, 1 to the 20, 20 to 1. Um, I would recommend actually reading the question, but um, you know you're going to get this, right? So we have our same AC generator, and all we're going to do is put a step up transformer in and a step down transformer. We're going to have that same resistor. We've still got our dairy over here, and we're just going to label with all the same information we had before. So that's still 30 ohms. I assume this is still putting out 1,000 watts at 240.4 volts, unless I'm told otherwise. Um, and that's about all the information we have. We should probably put the ratios on here. So this is a 1 to 20 step up transformer. And this is a 20 to 1 step down transformer. And... I think that's about all the information we have. Okay, all right, on to the next one. All right, calculate the power lost in transition in this new arrangement. Okay, so we're still putting out, it would seem, we're still putting out the same amount of power, 1,000 watts, so, and at the same voltage, 240.4 RMS. So that means we're putting out the same amount of current we did before. So let me just go back to this diagram. So. We're down here, the generator here, we haven't been told that anything's changed there. So we're going to have to assume that we're putting out the same amount of current. So we can find that current there by looking at P equals IV. Sorry, it's not on screen there. We can find that current there by using P equals IV for the generator. And then what we can do is we can call that I1. We can step that up or step that down to get I2 and then we can step it up again to get I3. And because we're assuming our transformers are ideal, and because current itself is not ever used up, it just continually flows, that means these ratios are just going to be nice and nice and even factors of 20. We, we don't have to take account of things, um, of anything being lost, unlike with voltage. Okay, so we're going to find I1, and then we're going to propagate it through to I3. I1 is going to be a thousand watts divided by 240.4 volts 
and that's just the same answer we got before which was um, 4.159 amps 4.16 amps okay I2 remember the whole point of the step up transformer is to make this current smaller so it better be divided by 20 when we go into this, the transmission phase so it's going to be 1.59 amps divided by 20 0 0.21 or 0.208 amps let me just rule the second page in case I need it and I3 well we're just going to multiplying up by 20 again so that's just going to get us back where we started all right so those are our currents we're being asked to find power lost and remember power lost is just I squared R on the wires so if we're looking here, we're looking for the current that's going through this resistor here. It's going to be I2 times I2 squared times 30 ohms. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. So the power lost on the wires is going to be I2 squared R of the wires. And we'll just stick those numbers into our CAS. So it's going to be this one here squared. You cas, you're not allowed to use you cas. 1.297 uh, watts. So make sure we're not overstating our precision. Let's call it 1.30 watts. So a very small amount. So that's leaving 998.7 watts left for the dairy farm. So calculate the RMS voltage delivered to the dairy farm. Okay, well, we know the current in the dairy farm. We found that in the previous question. It's 4.159 amps. We know that it's getting all the power that's not being used up in the wires. So that's going to be P dairy equals uh, 998.7 watts. And we know that at the dairy, we can use P equals IV. So to get the V that's being delivered to the dairy farm, so we can go P dairy equals I dairy V dairy. So it's 1.16, not 4.5. And we have uh, the RMS voltage for the dairy is 240.1 volts. So um, we've only lost 0.3 of a volt as opposed to 120 odd volts in the previous um, situation. So um, definitely an improvement okay it's probably going to ask for efficiency comment on the efficiency something like that explain why this combination of step up and step step down transformers is used in this transition system in terms of the magnitude of the electric current in the wires so all it's saying here is we better make note of the fact that in that transmission section we had a lower current which allowed us to have um, uh, less loss in the wires Okay, so we're trying to explain why this combination is used. Okay, um, well, you want to be really clear about stating what the whole aim of this is, what the what the point of it is. So let's make our first sentence. We wish to minimize. We wish to minimize power loss in transmission. Okay, then we want to say we sort of want to we want to build the case for what sorts of things would contribute towards trans power loss in transmission and then we want to end by saying sort of that's why we did x y and z okay so we wish to minimize power loss in transmission power lost in wires is p equals i squared r don't be afraid to sort of mix a bit of maths in with your explanations um, some people have the idea in their head that they have to describe everything in words and some people have it in their heads that they just have to do algebra but um, a mix of the two is always a much better idea okay so power loss in wires is p equals i squared with r fixed okay with r fixed so the only thing that we have any power over is that i so minimizing losses is equivalent to minimizing current. You could probably find some shorter way to say all that, but I'm trying to be really explicit here. So minimizing losses is the same as minimizing current. 
Okay. To send the same volume of energy power at lower current, we must increase voltage. Probably not completely necessary this line, but let's be really explicit. We must increase voltage. The step up increases voltage in transmission leads to lower current and then you just want to finish off it finish it off by saying okay well if that's why we put the step up in why do we put the step down in so the step down transformer just lowers the voltage to make it appropriate to make it whatever voltage it needs to be for the dairy um, it's not a bad idea this is just a, a bit of a trick I suppose but it's not a bad idea to in the very last sentence or the very end of the last sentence to really explicitly refer to the scenario because it makes it clear in the examiner's mind that oh, this person is still thinking about the actual situation and not hasn't just abstracted away into just generic answers about um, you know copying out some notes from their book but they're actually thinking about the scenario and it's cheap you just throw a word on the end instead of saying in the load you say in the dairy and suddenly people think you're you're working harder than you are okay all right, explain how the step-up transformer operates in terms of electromagnetic induction and how this would be affected if a DC power supply was used instead of AC. So the first thing to know is we've got two questions here and so we're going to be really explicit about answering both of them separately. First, you're being asked how does a step-up transformer work in terms of EM induction and secondly, you're asked, being asked why, how would it be changed if DC power supply were used. Okay, so... In an ideal world, what we're going to do is our first answer is going to make the second answer nice and trivial, so the second answer can be nice and short. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to give a nice, comprehensive explanation of how a step-up transformer works. Um, I would draw a diagram here. You're going to be referring to a bunch of things, primary coils, secondary coils, iron cores, all this sort of stuff, and it's going to be so much easier for the person reading it to follow if there's a diagram for them to look at. Um, just a VCAA exam has more open space than this, but I'm just going to draw it down here uh, in the margins. doesn't have to be huge as long as it's nice and clear. So I'm going to start with my iron core. I'm going to draw my primary coil like this. I'm going to draw my secondary coil. Don't worry too much about exactly what it looks like. Um, there's our secondary coil. And we're going to talk through... Um, how this thing works. So it's a step up transformer. So it explicitly wants you to talk about the fact that it says explain how a step up transformer and not just any old transformer works suggests it really wants you to talk about um, there being more windings on this side. So we could maybe even put in a few extras here to make it clear that there's more on that side. Okay. You want to label anything that you're going to be talking up at, about up here on this diagram. But one tip from me is I would wait until you actually mention it and then come and label it. Mention it, label it, mention it, label it. Um, so that you're not just labeling everything, you're, label, you're really drawing the attention to the things um, you want the examiner to see. Okay, so let's just talk through how this works. Um, we're going to put a varying, um, place a varying current through the primary coil. Okay, and all right, let's label the primary coil coil, this red thing here, I suppose you might want to point at the actual coil itself, um, we we'll place a varying current through the primary coil. This creates a varying magnetic field. You may or may not want to draw in the magnetic field. Do it here. There we go. Okay. Um, in the iron core. So we're trying to be quite sparse in our language. We're trying to sort of just be really just focusing on those things that are really key. Core. Okay. Um, the secondary coil, or this, this magnetic field passes through the secondary coil, which gives us a changing magnetic flux. Okay, and then you can almost you can almost skip ninety percent of the possible words here and just use a few symbols, but uh, this leads to an induced. EMF 
and it's not a bad idea to name check the, the law of physics here via Faraday's law. If you want to, you can write the equation there. Couldn't do any harm. Right, so an induced EMF by Faraday's law. We haven't really talked about the fact that it's a step up transformer. So let's do that now. Um, the EMF is proportional to the number of windings so if n2 is greater than n1 okay what the hell are n2 and n1 let's label those on the diagram uh, we'll put n1 turns here secondary and we'll put n2 turns here so we're just saving ourselves words up here. We're just saving ourselves having to explain, oh, what do I mean by N2? What do I mean by that? We're just putting it on the diagram. Obviously, you'd want a bigger diagram than this. I just don't have space. Okay. Um, the EMF is proportional to the number of windings. So if N2 is greater than N1, then we um, output a larger... Okay. Um, Okay, so that's how a step-up transformer works. And then, because we've kind of, I've been looking ahead to how I'm going to answer this next part, I kept on using the word varying, right? So now all I really have to say is, this process requires a changing flux from the varying magnetic field, therefore, um, we need the current to be changing, DC doesn't do it, etc., etc. So let's sort of tidy that up a little bit. Um, I'm almost, I mean, also going to rule a line so it's clear that I'm sort of answering a second part of the question now. You don't have to do that, but it's helpful. Um, this required a varying B field to create changing flux. If DC is used, current will be constant, resulting no change, therefore no induced EMF. So you'll notice my answer is kind of long. Um, you could definitely shorten this down, you could get it into bullet points, you could use more abbreviations. Um, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from sort of getting this sharpening this up a little bit, um, but I'm trying to be really explicit in that and answer that as fully as I can. Okay, we're on the final two questions now. Question 9 and question 10. It's gotten a little bit dark outside, so I'll turn the light on there. Okay, now question 9. Explain how this wind-powered AC generator would be different from a wind-powered DC generator. Okay, um, so they're, they're, they're kind of asking you to, uh, to fill in a lot of the gaps in the question here for yourself, but um, what they're really saying is, how do you actually make an AC generator as opposed to a DC generator? If they're both wind-powered, then the input is exactly the same. So the input is just a rotor that's spinning round and round. So the question is, how do you get AC out of a spinning uh, a spinning turbine or a spinning armature as opposed to DC? And that's all about the, uh, the commutator that you use. So um, it's only worth two marks, so let's not go overboard with our answer. So... Um, we can just say inside the generator armature, the induced EMF is AC. To get AC electricity in the external circuit, we use a slip ring while DC we connect. So it's only worth two marks, so it's really looking for you to just identify that DC, split ring commutator, AC, slip ring. Um, the, the four mark version of this question is where you, they ask you also to explain the operation of the split ring commutator. So the way that it, um, the way that it flips the current every half turn. Um, but you're not being asked to do that here and it's only worth two marks. So you're really just looking to identify that the difference here between an AC generator and a DC is just which type of commutator you stick on there. 
All right, identify and describe two sources of power loss that may occur in these transformers and explain how they may be reduced. Now, we haven't really talked about this in class, so completely fair if you just uh, left this one and didn't really talk about it. Um, but just thinking about structure, it's an identify question, so that means you just really have to explicitly list. It's explicitly asking for two, so let's just rule up the middle of the page and let's just identify one here and identify one here, and that'll get us the two marks. And then the explanation is how we're going to get the other two marks. Okay, um, so as I say, we haven't really talked about these, so I'll just quickly explain two sources of um, losses in transformers. Um, yep, so we want losses in the transformers, um, which you might want to think about. Okay, the first is that what you've got on one side, or on both sides really, is two solenoids. So your primary coil and your secondary coil are really solenoids. If we have um, two solenoids that have varying magnetic fields in them, one of them because of the primary current, but one of them because of that EMF, because of that lens lower induced um, current, then what we basically have is two magnets, two electromagnets right near each other that keep on changing direction. And inevitably, if you put two magnets next to each other that have a varying magnetic field, they're going to be attracting and repulsing each other. They're going to be trying to align with each other. There's going to be a magnetic force between them, and that magnetic force is going to be changing. So that's actually going to cause accelerations, little accelerations back and forth, little vibrations between the two solenoids. So, um, so we could say magnetic forces uh, may cause vibration in the transformer coils. Transformer coils. You don't really have to go into a lot of detail. It doesn't say to explain in detail how these two things come about. It says to explain how they can be reduced. So how would you reduce vibration? Because um, if you think about, so I should probably point out that why does that why do you lose energy from that? Well, if things are vibrating, they're making noise, they're um, heating up, um, and they have kinetic energy from moving. So that's a use of energy that isn't putting AMF into your load down the line. So how do you stop them from vibrating? You, you physically lock them down. So just, um, so uh, bolt, bolting in the transformers and holding them steady. and therefore energy loss. Okay, so that's one place you can go. Um, that one's not super interesting because that's just that's just vibrations. Um, one that's a little bit more interesting is that if we think about what's happening in a transformer, what we've got is a magnetic field which is circulating back and forth inside that iron core. And iron, of course, is made of metal and so it conducts electricity. So even though we don't think of the, the electricity doesn't flow from the primary through the iron core to the secondary, these are two separate circuits, but because we have a changing magnetic field inside the iron, we actually have a changing magnetic flux through the iron, and if those electrons are able to circulate um, in reaction to that changing flux and the EMF that gets produced, then you're actually going to get currents inside the iron not carrying electricity from one to the other, but actually circulating around inside the iron, and we call those currents eddy currents. Um, when we get back to school, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about eddy currents. Um, so eddy currents inside the iron core. Okay, so eddy currents inside the iron core, they're going to use up some of that electrical energy. Um, how do we reduce them? Um, it's actually pretty clever. The idea is we want if you imagine looking at your iron core side on, we want magnetic field lines going around this way. And they're actually going to produce eddy currents which go around this way. Um, because the area that the magnetic field lines are passing through this way, so the boundary is this is here. So we've got magnetic field lines going around this way, those are the things we actually want. And we've got electric currents going around this way, those are the things we don't want. So what we actually do is we slice up the iron core in this direction. So if we imagine turning towards you, each of my fingers is a separate layer of metal. So the magnetic fields can go around in this direction, but the currents can't propagate through. Now that's a really hard thing to explain in words and with your hands in 
but I can explain that to you much better when we get back to school and I'll actually show you what this looks like. But this process is called laminating the iron core. And to get the mark in a question like this, all they're really looking for is that word laminating. So um, to prevent circulating currents, we're going to use a laminated iron core and it doesn't do any harm to underline the word laminated there. Okay, so that just, that process, I'll show it to you next week. It'd be much easier to think about when you can see it. Um, that process stops those eddy currents from circulating round and round. Okay, I think that's it. I've run out of pieces of paper, so I think we might be done with this problem. Um, and yeah, so if you have any questions, if you still have any questions about those, or if you did any of these problems in a different way and want to check whether your answer is correct as well, then um, let me know and I'll, I'll, I can read over your work. Um, it's probably a very good idea. We're starting to get towards the part of the year where I would like to see how you write explain answers and be able to give you some feedback on that, especially on something that's maybe not as high stakes as a SAC. Um, so um, if you do want me to have a read of one of your explain answers and tell you how you can improve it, then just let me know and I'm happy to have a read. Okay? All right. I'll see you later, guys.